Intamin Amusement Rides may very well be the most dynamic and trailblazing attraction manufacturer of all time. In an industry that is full of derivative ideas and copycats, there is no designer who nearly always moves to the beat of their own drum like Intamin. While like any company, they take ideas that follow industry trends, since their inception, they have always been the sole manufacturer you go to for the most ambitious and greatest amusement rides ever built. Their full roller coaster history is quite dense and unprecedented to explore, and that will be the point of this series, to go year by year and track each innovation and see how each small creation adds up and learns from each other. Everything starts somewhere. Plenty of manufacturers had built their take on small steel children's coasters, including Myler, BA Shift, Alan Herschel, and Zaire, to name a few. Opening year after the senior, Junior Gemini opened in 1979 along with the Schwarzkopf built Wildcat at Cedar Point. The ride opened across the midway from the giant American Aero coaster that had opened the previous year for the children who were not old enough to ride yet. The tiny coaster was under 20 feet tall and 500 feet long, but created the children coaster model, which caught the eye of many parks in the early years. Just two years later, Intamin was contacted to build their first thrill coaster for Marriott's Great America. This would not be a larger steel coaster, or even one coaster, but a giant racing wooden coaster. The tallest in the world, in fact, with American Eagle. While Great America had quite an impressive collection of coasters at the time, American Eagle would be the park's first original layout and stood at an impressive 127 feet tall. The ride featured not only a massive out and back layout, similar to other racing wooden coasters at the time, but a comically massive epic helix both coasters would travel as well. The ride still runs and dominates today, although it's very unlikely you'll see both sides racing together again due to the ride's weathered structure. Between 1982 and 1983, Intamin was solely focused on Parque de la Ciudad in Argentina. This wouldn't just be for one coaster or even two, but three. The first of these to open and the smallest was Montaña Rusa Infantil or simply children's roller coaster. This was nearly the same coaster layout of Junior Gemini with small hills and a tiny lift hill. This was followed up two months later with Super Montaña Rusa Infantil or Super Children's Roller Coaster. This featured the same track and train design but sported a lift which looked to be nearly twice as tall and a much larger drop and hill. With these three children coasters built, it looked like Intamin had a surefire model in place, but the third coaster for the park would be anything but that. Intamin would attempt to build Vertigo Rama, a giant racing steel coaster. The information about this ride is very conflicting online, with most sources claiming it never operated, and others thinking the ride was one track layout. But thanks to fantastic local drone footage, it can clearly be seen it was two separate tracks that never crossed over each other. Two trains have sat on both sides of the track for its existence, but no station was ever built, and now it is left to sit and be taken over by nature. After a two-year span of working on projects for just one park, Intamin would build their most coasters in one year to that point with five. First, another children's coaster for a small Hanna-Barbera theme park in Texas named Scooby-Doo. Pictures of this ride are hard to come by, but it was relocated west three years later to Marriott's Great America in California. Next, another children's coaster was built for Kuwait Entertainment City. This ride has no name listed, but has one of the craziest note sections on all of RCDB. The real coasters this year would come from Intamin's third fully realized coaster model in the bobsled coaster. Very fitting for a Swiss company, this revival coaster type would seat riders in single car bobsled trains down a steel trough, a year before mock rides would unveil a similar concept model. 
With the help of fellow Swiss manufacturer Gio Vanola as a subcontractor, three installations would open. Screamin' Delta Demon at Opryland and the Sarajevo Bobsleds at Magic Mountain and Great Adventure. All three featured the same layout and would end up traveling quite a bit, with Magic Mountains headed to Six Flags Over Texas after just one year, and Great Adventures moving from Six Flags Great America and then to The Great Escape. Screamin' Delta Demon would be sent to a park in Indiana and never open again. The next year found another three coasters opening, including the only two other bobsled coasters built, this time both featuring custom layouts. These were Bob at Efteling and Avalanche Run at Cedar Point. The latter saw Intamin returning to their original buyer with higher demands than any bobsled coaster. This was the only design to feature two across seating and would later be modified to be a fully enclosed indoor coaster named Disaster Transport. The big coaster for this year would be an incredibly ambitious, compact design using an entirely new style of track. Working again with Gio Vanola, the companies came up with a large squared spine and the first ever four-person wide coaster car. This bulky train would traverse a compact, dense track with swooping bank drops, giving this model the name of Space Diver. The near-inverting drops were highly innovative for the time, with drops even steeper than Schwarzkopf's at the time, which could be the only thing considered similar. Opening a Z-Force as the first installation at the now Six Flags Great America, the coaster also found itself being relocated like the bobsled coasters to Six Flags Over Georgia before ending its run with quite a long life at Six Flags Magic Mountain as Flashback. After a few years of Aero attempting and Togo building a new concept of stand-up coasters, Intamin and Giovanola returned the next year with their new box fine track for Shockwave at Six Flags Magic Mountain. Ironically being built in the exact same spot as the Intamin Sarajevo bobsleds just two years before, this ride would feature essentially the same four wide, five car trains as Z-Force, just standing up. The layout would also feature Intamin's first true inversion, with just one vertical loop and many swooping turns through the layout. It would operate a total of 19 years at three different parks before being sent to a fourth where it would sit in storage and be removed in 2017. Intamin would return two years later with another stand-up coaster simply named Stand Up at Scara Summerland. This coaster would feature the same layout as Shockwave and would operate for six years before being relocated to Le Ronde. 1988 also may have been the year a mysterious unknown indoor family coaster opened in Saudi Arabia. No pictures or proper information exist for this ride. So it's unknown if this was a children's style coaster or their family indoor coaster that would debut many years later. It would be another three years until the next Intamin coaster was built, and it would be going back to a model they hadn't built in 10 years. Pegasus would be a family wooden coaster at the beautiful Efteling. After this year, Intamin would be taking no time off with at least one coaster opening every year since. While Pegasus was a family wooden coaster, Jupiter at Kijimo Kogan would be anything but. This behemoth would be the first wooden coaster in Japan and feature a very nice L-shaped layout with an extended pre-lift section, a large diving pre-drop, and many fast bunny hills. This and Pegasus also happen to be the last two coasters designed by the famous DIN engineer Curtis D. Summers and is actually still the fifth longest and sixth tallest wooden coaster in the world. After taking the last few years relatively slow, Intamin would debut two new models for 1993, the multi-inversion coaster and the family indoor coaster. The former would be their first coaster for Disney with Indiana Jones et le Tempo du Perro for the new Euro Disneyland. 
While listed as a multi-inversion coaster, this attraction would feature only a single vertical loop and would wrap around a temple facade in a compact minecar style train. The other coaster would be the strange lightning bolt at MGM Grand Adventure in Las Vegas. The ride was not strange upon opening, just a standard indoor coaster with a small size, a new train style, and two helices. Things got weird just three years later when the ride was relocated to a different location in the park where it would now run outside. It operated like this for one year and then was doubled in length with a second half built by Aerodynamics. It ran as this until the park closed, until it sat in storage and was eventually scrapped. Nineteen ninety four would not see any new coaster models, but three new layouts. First was another family indoor coaster, the Dragon at La Ronde, featuring a castle facade and a medieval theme. The next would be Shockwave at Drayton Manor, which may have the same name as a previous coaster, but would actually be Intamin's only stand up coaster with a custom layout, featuring the only zero G roll ever on this type of ride. The last would be White Cyclone at Nagashima Spa Land. This massive ride would open as the fourth tallest wooden coaster in the world and the tallest outside of America. Featuring an incredible sprawling layout with a giant helix, this ride would operate for just over 25 years before being converted by Rocky Mountain Construction into the hybrid coaster Hakuge. The next year would be for the families, with two small-scale coasters opening, both being built in South Korea. Viper would open at Play Village and feature the new style family coaster trains with an extremely wooded layout, which was later cut back significantly. The second would be Comet Express at Lot World, one of the first modern spinning coasters built since the Virginia Reel. This new twist and turn coaster spins through three rooms in a fully indoor layout with an intergalactic theme. Up to this point, Intamin had still been trying to find their footing as a roller coaster manufacturer. While offering some unique models, they still needed to find out who they would be to set themselves apart from other companies, as the competitive roller coaster war was about to reach its peak. Their first big swing of the year would be Skull Mountain at Six Flags Great Adventure. While this would be just another family indoor coaster, the original facade and theme work done for this attraction was truly ambitious for the time. The ride is fully indoors with a compact layout and featured new two-row family coaster cars. The next coaster would be a new model and truly an attempt at something new at the time. There was a growing interest at the end of the 90s for new roller coaster models of any kind, including the inline pipeline roller coasters, but no manufacturer ever got it quite right. Intamin's attempt would be Sky Plaza Comet in South Korea. This strange ride would be pushed through most of the layout by drive tires through four inversions in a super compact and short layout inside a hotel. This coaster only operated for three years before being sent to Kuwait, where it would run another five years before standing abandoned most of its life. The biggest and best coaster of the year would be next, and would be Intamin's most impressive and groundbreaking design to that point. Featuring two unique tracks, an indoor and outdoor layout, and Intamin's first ever trademark Heartline role, Lethal Weapon Pursuit was truly one of the most impressive coasters ever built to that point. The theme work done by Warner Brothers at the time was revolutionary, featuring an impressive queue that took riders through multiple buildings and themed cop car vehicles that would travel through a loop inside the building and an unbelievable flaming car special effect. For a comprehensive history of this ride, I highly recommend watching Tyrannicoaster's incredible video on it. He has no views or subscribers, but all his videos are amazing quality and highly informative. Nineteen ninety seven started off relatively standard with two more family coaster models. The first of which was Montagna Russa do Astronauta at Park de Monica. This coaster would have the same layout as Viper, which had opened two years prior, but indoors and with a space theme. 
The second would be a new coaster at the oldest park in the world, Bakken. Mine Train Ulven would prove to be a popular layout, being cloned twice long after opening, and features a thrilling drop and great setting for a children's coaster, with similar style trains to Skull Mountain. So to this point, Intamin had built many children and family coasters, bobsled coasters, wooden coasters, stand-up coasters, multi-inversion coasters, and a couple other small attempts of innovations. So naturally, their next innovation would be to build the tallest and fastest coaster in the world. Oh, I'm sorry, let me try that again. The two tallest and fastest coasters in the world. Superman the Escape and Tower of Terror would destroy the record for tallest coasters by over 100 feet each, and would also be Intamin's first ever launch coasters using a linear synchronous motor system. These would be the first coasters to ever use this technology, and while a year before Premier Rides debuted the linear induction motor launch, the LSM system would prove to be the standard that is used on countless coasters today. Riders would be blasted at speeds of 100 miles per hour up a massive spike, getting a long sustained moment of weightlessness before plummeting back down hundreds of feet. While this would not be a complete circuit ride, it absolutely planted the flag of Intamin's new identity. If you wanted to break records, the tallest, the fastest, the most intense coasters, Intamin would be the sole manufacturer to go to for the most extreme of thrill rides. Only they could smash the height and speed record, and it would be just the beginning of what they were about to achieve over the next decade. They would need a new standard style of track and a big statement coaster to show what they could really do. Nineteen ninety eight would be a year with more innovation ever seen from Intamin. But first, let's discuss Asuka at the famous Disneyland knockoff. Nara Dreamland. This coaster featured the classic cyclone layout, but looked to have incredible airtime throughout, and operated a short life at the park until its closure in 2006. This year would see the debut of a brand new track style for Intamin, which proved so successful it is still used today, a three-pipe triangle cross-tie track. This design provided the dynamic banking radius needed for tight turns and elements while also having the sturdy structure needed to comfortably absorb the forces and maintain a smooth ride. The first ride to ever open with this track would be Mont Makaya at Terra Encantada. This would use a similar car design to Lethal Weapon Pursuit, but with a much longer seven car train and shattering Intamin's previous inversion record with a staggering eight, tied for the most on any coaster at the time. These included a vertical loop, a cobra roll, two corkscrews, and most innovative of all, a triple heartline roll. This amazing disorienting element would not have been possible without the shaping innovated on Lethal Weapon Pursuit and became a building block for a very long series of multi-inversion coasters to come. This would only be the first half of coasters to open this year though, as this new track would also be flipped upside down for two new inverted coasters as well. Both using the LSM technology created the year before, these models were made to be an alternative to the inverted coaster that rival European companies B&M and Vekoma had debuted earlier in the 90s. These would be totally unique to those though, as the launches were much more the focus rather than the inversions. This debuted with Linear Gale at Tokyo Dome City, which would be a shuttle coaster that would travel back and forth on two straight spikes. Not only that, the coaster would be located on top of a building in downtown Tokyo, providing some of the most surreal visuals of any ride. This would only be the warm-up though, as the last coaster of 1998 would be Intamin's most dynamic ride to date. For years, King's Dominion was looking to build a coaster that would interact with the park's famous man-made mountain, which had held multiple attractions in its existence. Intamin's concept would be Volcano the Blast Coaster, which would be the first ever full circuit multi-launch coaster, sending riders out of and circling the rockwork with three heartline rolls. The ambition to build a multi-launch prototype inverted coaster around an existing structure with incredible fire effects proved to be a massive success, 
and not only proved to be a fan favorite, but truly drew the eyes to Intamin as Volcano was one of the best coasters ever made to that point. The next year would be another year of experimenting for Intamin, starting with another mystery coaster. Not every ride can be a success, and Future World Experience would be another in the line of unknown rides. It is said to have been an interactive coaster with 3D glasses and screens mounted on the trains, which would be a first for a roller coaster, but nothing more is known about the train style or any other details. The next coaster would be a new twist and turn coaster named Boorang at Hopi Hari. This ride would travel inside an impressive pyramid facade with a turn outside and feature a train with a giant eyeball being held in a talon. There would also be an evolution of the inverted coaster the previous year, this time featuring a lift hill instead of a launch. Tornado would open at Parque de Atracciones Madrid, featuring two loops and a corkscrew, as well as many positive G-filled turns. But the real highlight of the year would take Intamin's lift technology to new heights. The emergence of the hypercoaster in the 90s became the peak of what parks could add as a standout coaster, and was attempted by many different manufacturers, but it was time for Intamin to take their swing. Theme to the most popular superhero of all time, Superman Ride of Steel would tower over the skyline of the now Six Flags Darien Lake. Every mega coaster of the time featured layouts focused almost exclusively on large hills that would get progressively smaller during the ride. Superman would feature a layout with a focus on long straight sections and two massive double helixes to showcase the speed of the coaster above the beautiful setting on the water. Along with this was a brand new eight car train that featured a completely unique exposed seating style compared to other manufacturers with an incredibly comfortable and thin lap bar. The speed, smoothness, and diverse layout would attract many parks' attention for the next year and many more to come. At the turn of the millennium, there were signs. Intamin had now fully come into their own, and the time for experimenting was over. As they were one of the three manufacturers at the time with the ability to build launch coasters, they were now a go-to if not the most desired manufacturer, and 2000 would be the true landmark year for them. First was another wooden coaster named Regina at Tobu Zoo. This giant woody featured an intense layout over water with a large helix and many steep drops. The coaster recently sat without operating for four years before being fully retracked and receiving new trains from Great Coasters International and going by Regina 2. Six Flags had proved to be Intamin's favorite customer over their entire history, and that was not going to change with three more massive coasters this year, all themed to the Man of Steel. The first was Superman Ultimate Escape at Six Flags Ohio, a new impulse coaster. This model featured two key differences from the prototype, a twisting spike going forward and a holding brake on the spike going backwards to stop the trains for a moment before releasing giving an extra thrill to riders. The second coaster would be a near exact copy of Superman Ride of Steel from the previous year, down to the name at Six Flags America. While the coaster had the same layout, it would not have the same setting, taking place in the woods rather than above water. The last would also be named Superman Ride of Steel, this time at Six Flags New England, but would take Intamin's hyper technology to a whole new level. While having the same track length as the other two mega coasters, this layout would drop the straight track and two helixes for one of the best layouts ever created. Featuring incredible hills, tunnels, and amazing lateral turns, the coaster has consistently been considered a top steel coaster ever made. But if that's not your style... Returning to the park Intamin had built their first coaster at, Cedar Point was ready to end the argument for best coaster park in the world. They weren't trying to build a great coaster, they were trying to build the best coaster of all time. Reaching heights over 300 feet, speeds over 90 miles per hour, and a layout over 6,000 feet, Millennium Force would reach stats thought untouchable for a coaster and became a massive hit for the park. To reach this height, 
Intamin developed an elevator cable lift system to take the train up faster, as well as not needing the massive chain that would be required for such height. The setting right along the lake and above the island is one of the most iconic for many visitors, and its layout focusing on sheer speed more than airtime or any specific elements made the ride more thrilling and unique to other coasters. This would strengthen an already strong relationship with Intamin and Cedar Point, and this, along with New England's Ride of Steel, gave the company two strong contenders for best thrill machines ever built. This momentum would propel Intamin into the hearts of coaster lovers and into the eyes of every park in the world. As if it wasn't known already, Intamin was ready to be king. After building five coasters the previous year, including three that were at least 200 feet, demand did not slow down at all, with eight coasters opening in 2001. Kicking it off was their second coaster for Disney, this time being an opening day attraction at the new California Adventure Park. Being constructed with a very unique steel structure to mimic the look of a wooden boardwalk coaster, California Screamin' featured a less thrilling layout than the coasters that opened the previous year, but still featured an LIM launch, one inversion, and an over 6,000 foot layout. The coaster also featured onboard audio with an original soundtrack, which was still very impressive for the time. There would also be three more Twist and Spike impulse coasters, with Screaming Condor at Leo Faux Village and V2 Vertical Velocity, at Six Flags Great America and Six Flags Discovery Kingdom. These were all clones their opening year until California height restrictions required modifications to the vertical velocity at Discovery Kingdom. As a result, the back spike was cut from its original 185 feet to 150 feet and the forward spike was turned on its side, resulting in the twist now being an inversion. This made it certainly the most unique impulse coaster, and it still operates in this state today. Next would be their second and last ever suspended looping coaster, ironically also named Tornado at Finland's Sarkaniemi. This installation was much more inversion focused, with a loop, cobra roll, and two heartline rolls, including one over the station. With this new identity of giant thrill rides being the standard, it was time for Intamin to give one of their original models a last hoorah. Elf would open at Hirakata Park as the last traditional wooden coaster Intamin would ever construct. It would feature an oval layout with simple turns and drops and may have inspired the layout of a coaster that would open a few years later. While Elf would be the end of the traditional wooden coasters, Intamin was shelving it for something new entirely. Using the same precision of fabricating steel coasters, Intamin came up with a concept to build all the track needed for wooden coasters in their factory so no wood cutting construction was needed on site. This method for prefabricated track would debut just one month after ELF on Colossus at Heidi Park. It would debut as the third tallest and second fastest wooden coaster in the world and provided a vastly smoother ride than those ahead of it. New three-row wooden coaster trains were developed for this model, with similar lap bars to the mega coasters, and helped navigate the trains over incredibly strong ejector airtime hills, with power that had never been attempted on a wooden coaster. To finish 2001 would be a smaller stature mega coaster for the small holiday park in Germany. While on the surface, the stats didn't seem to stand out as much as the crazy coasters that had opened this year and the last, but it would be widely regarded again as their best design to that point. Even to the point of its designer Werner Stengel claiming Expedition G-Force to be his favorite design. Using the same cable lift developed for Millennium Force, but at nearly half the height, this ride would begin with a wicked twisting drop and provide an incredible layout filled with airtime and laterals through the woods. The next year would be another of great steel behemoths taking shape, starting with another mega coaster for Six Flags Holland. Goliath would stand even shorter than Expedition G-Force, but still provide a very satisfying layout, similar to the original Superman Ride of Steel coasters. 
The one new element introduced for this ride would be a banked diving drop that would be known as a Stengel dive, named after the ride's designer. Also opening would be the last twist and turn coaster known as Sahara Twist at Leofo Village. Cedar Point would also return with the tallest impulse coaster to date, Wicked Twister. The coaster reached heights over 200 feet and featured twists on both spikes. Intamin would also build another 8 inversion coaster known as Avalancha at Guatemala's Chetalul. This would also be the same color scheme as Mont Macaya, but with a new train innovation. Using the same chassis as the mega coaster trains, these would be retrofitted to have the over the shoulder restraints instead of lap bars. Not only was this debuted on Avalancha, but for an even bigger multi inversion coaster. Colossus would open at Thorpe Park as the world's first coaster to feature 10 inversions. The layout would be the same as the 8 inversion coasters, but replacing the triple heartline roll for an even crazier quadruple heartline roll, and removing the final helix for another heartline roll for the finale. Finally, the speed was about to get turned up even more with the debut of another new launch system. While the LSM magnets were still in their infancy, Intamin developed a system that was capable of a much faster and more powerful acceleration. This hydraulic launch system used a cable pulling a catch car attached to the train to blast riders down the track with incredible force. This accelerator coaster would fittingly debut on Accelerator at Knott's Berry Farm, rocketing riders from 0 to 82 miles per hour in just 2.3 seconds to crest a 200-foot, first-of-its-kind top hat element. This would be a steep parabolic crest that would become a popular tall element for coasters to launch into, and was followed up by some fast overbank turns. While this system would prove to be somewhat unreliable, the powerful eye-catching launch still turned the heads of many parks around the world. Two thousand three could be seen as the end of the original coaster wars, as world events started to slow parks from investing as much into massive rides. But Intamin would finish it off with a bang with seven new coasters, all of which being different models. Starting it off would be the second prefabricated wooden coaster known as Balder at Leesburg. This would be a smaller coaster than Colossus, but still featured a smooth ride with many airtime hills and an oval layout that may have been inspired by the previously mentioned Elf. Next would be the last of the original Impulse coasters, being Steel Venom at Valley Fair. This would be the last twist and spike model, but with one shuttle coaster ending, a new one would rise. This time, riders would be seated in two spinning circles of eight on a giant skateboard-like ride vehicle and would travel up two vertical spikes. This ride experience mimicked a skater going up and down a half pipe, so the model and coaster were fittingly named that. The first would open at Sarkaniemi, where it would operate for 15 years. Following that up would be an incredibly unique multi-looper located inside a mall in Malaysia. Strangely featuring the old multi-looping trains, Supersonic Odyssey at Cosmos World would feature a compact layout full of tight turns but also a heartline roll, a loop wrapping a bridge, and a corkscrew. Not to be outdone for a coaster in a dynamic location, Tokyo Dome City would once again ask Intamin to build a coaster on top of a building at their park. This time, instead of a straight line coaster, the ride would feature perhaps the most ambitious engineering location of any ride ever. Thunder Dolphin would be a massive 262 foot mega coaster that would be built entirely on top of a parking garage and a building in earthquake-prone downtown Tokyo. The coaster was ingeniously designed to have high-speed moments, but to slow down at just the right times to not exert too much force when jumping over and through the buildings. It's not often Intamin will build a pure one-off coaster model, but there are the rare exceptions. Atlantis Adventure at Lot World is certainly a coaster that many would take a first glance at and not think too much, but the impact of this ride is far greater than you may expect. First of all, the coaster featured a single low-profile eight-passenger train, 
almost similar to the prefabricated wooden coaster cars, and feature handlebars to almost mimic a straddle riding position. Second, this would be the first coaster to have an LSM lift as well as an LSM launch, used to blast through and above the immaculately themed Atlantis Temple. Finally, this ride would be known as an Aquatrax coaster and have sections of water spraying at the bottom of the train to mimic splashing through a water trough. While this ride model didn't catch on, several design aspects of future coasters can be drawn back to this ride. To close the year and the entire coaster wars out, Cedar Point would once again dare any park to challenge their record-breaking ability. While Millennium Force broke the height record when it opened, it was beaten just three months later by the Morgan-built Steel Dragon 2000 in Japan. Not only that, it could still be said that Superman the Escape at Magic Mountain was always taller and faster, even though it did not complete a full circuit. To end all these debates, Cedar Point would use the hydraulic launch technology developed the year before to build the undisputed tallest and fastest roller coaster in the world. Top Thrill Dragster would launch riders 120 miles per hour in four seconds to crest a 420 foot top hat, finishing with a spiraling drop towards the ground. While the coaster essentially just did one element, the engineering scale of the ride and power of the launch was a thing to marvel. With this, Intamin had now built half of the 10 tallest coasters ever made in just six years and held on to their title of being the only manufacturer willing and able to reach the highest heights. After years of breaking records and developing a handful of new models, the industry would slow down as Intamin would debut just two coasters for 2004. There would be another half-pipe coaster at Six Flags Elitch Gardens, as well as the Accelerator Storm Runner at Hershey Park. This would be the first hydraulic launch coaster with a full layout, featuring a top hat, a uniquely shaped dive loop, and the absolutely wicked element known as the Flying Snake Dive. This inversion would feature a sort of double heartline roll that would violently dive at the end of its second twist. This coaster would also use a prototype train with a chassis similar to the mega coasters and new multi-loopers, but having new over-the-shoulder restraint system with a large round lap bar and thin but hard shoulder restraints, which would become the standard for most intimate accelerators from then on. Two thousand five would see a trio of coasters be built in Japan starting with another coaster for Disney at the immaculately themed Tokyo Disney Sea. Raging Spirits would be a near exact copy of Indiana Jones et le Temple du Peril, down to the very old style trains, but with an original theme and located in the park's Lost River Delta section. Also opening would be the very strange and unique Galaxy Express 999 at Aqua Park. Themed to a very popular manga and anime series, Riders would be sent out of the station with a tire-propelled launch through an indoor layout with space lighting effects and a loop. Only one on-ride video exists of the coaster, and since it was all indoors, it is hard to tell what the ride experience fully consisted of. But given its launch system and one-of-a-kind train, it certainly was a very unique coaster. Also worth noting, the Don Quixote outlet store must have been inspired by Tokyo Dome City down the street as they attempted to build another half-pipe coaster on their roof. The coaster never opened as it was believed the building was unable to handle the forces exerted from the ride and it sat for over 10 years before being removed. This year was undoubtedly the year of the accelerator coaster though, as five opened, all featuring the new trains and over-the-shoulder restraints. Starting with the smallest, Alton Towers would look to Intamin to build their next secret weapon. Due to the park's rules of not being able to build coasters over the trees, Rita, Queen of Speed, would launch from 0 to 61 miles per hour and twist and turn no more than 70 feet off the ground. Not much taller, Leesburg's Cannonin would launch to a slower speed than Rita, but feature a tighter layout with two inversions including a loop and a slow downward inline twist at the end. 
The next would be Skycar at Mysterious Island, featuring an intense layout with a vertical loop, followed by Superman Escape at Warner Brothers Movie World Australia. This ride would feature a full pre-launch section with incredible theming and effects, followed by many airtime hills and turns, with a figure of Superman to push you along the way. But these would hardly be noteworthy compared to the last coaster of the year. When Cedar Point challenged any park to beat their height record, only one was able to stand up to the task, and that would be Six Flags Great Adventure. Beating Dragster's height by 36 feet and top speed by 8 miles per hour, King Daka would be the self-proclaimed king of coasters at a shocking 456 feet tall. Also featuring a hill after the drop, King Daka reached heights that other parks have only dreamed of and remains the tallest coaster in the world to this day. Two thousand six would be a bit of a slowdown year for Intamin, as it would see the end of a few models and many similar layouts to years before, but still had many huge rides of note opening. There would be the final eight inversion coaster with Flight of the Phoenix at Harborland, and a final installation of the original ten inversion roller coaster layout, named simply that at Chimalong Paradise, as well as the last half pipe coaster at the same park. This year would also see three more accelerator coasters open as well, starting with Stealth at Thorpe Park and Zattern at Space World. These two coasters featured the same layout and were nearly half the stats of King Daka in every way, including a hill at the end, but with a straight drop instead of a twist. Also opening would be Tusenfried's Speed Monster, featuring a very scenic layout through the trees, with a unique inversion known as a Norwegian Loop given the park's location. This inversion would enter the loop from the top, twist down, and then twist back upright at the apex. The ride also featured a corkscrew at the end and many banked hills throughout, and would be Intamin's first attempt at using a shorter three-car train for a more snappy ride experience. But easily, the crown jewel of the year would come from Intamin's third prefabricated wooden coaster, El Toro. Just one year after adding the tallest coaster in the world, Intamin and Great Adventure would return for a ride full of incredible airtime never seen on a wooden coaster in the United States. This would also be the first prefabricated coaster to use a cable lift and have a fast-paced twister finale full of low-to-the-ground turns and become a fan favorite for all roller coaster riders in America. After fleshing out their worldwide lineup of attractions, it was time for Intamin to start experimenting again, with almost every coaster for 2007 being a new model. This would start with Intamin's take on the Fourth Dimension coaster. Aerodynamics premiered this concept with X at Six Flags Magic Mountain, and then SNS would build a similar coaster the year before with Ijanaika at Fuji Q Highland. These coasters would seat riders outside the track, with an extra rail rotating the seats to a predetermined position. These coasters were also massive 200 plus foot coasters, with large multi-car trains. Intamin would scale this concept way back, to a single car that would seat riders back to back, and would freely spin through a less than 100 foot tall layout, known as the Zack Spin. These coasters would also rotate around the backs of riders and feature a similar restraint to the accelerator coasters, but with softer fabric straps. The first two to open would be Kirnu at Linen Maki and Inferno at Terra Mitica, and would have the same layout, consisting of a unique double chain curved lift and one big drop to try to flip riders and then a hop into the brakes. The next new model would be another take of another manufacturer's concept with Mick Doohan's Moto Coaster at Dreamworld. Vekoma had introduced the Booster Bike Coaster a few years before, where riders were seated as if they were on motorcycles to give a unique seating position. Intamins would be themed to the famous Australian motorbike racer and feature a tire launch through a few low turns. The coaster featured a unique restraint where riders would have to lift a padded bar above their backs and then pull the front of the bike onto themselves. 
Australia would also see the debut of the second generation of the halfpipe with Surfrider at Wet n Wild Waterworld. This version would feature a shorter, singular surfboard that would seat only six riders on each circle instead of eight, and spikes that were slightly beyond vertical. The year would also see another two hydraulic launch coasters, one being familiar with Desert Race at Heidi Park, which would be a near clone of Rita Queen of Speed, and a second that would be something completely different than anything seen before. At the same time Intamin was working on rotating seats outside the track, they also developed a fixed version where riders would sit on the wings but experience a traditional layout. This would debut on Furious Baco at Port Aventura, which would use a hydraulic launch to blast riders from 0 to 84 miles per hour in 3.5 seconds into a low to the ground layout with a slow inline twist while seated on the outside of the track. This would turn out to be the only time this train style was used, making this a very unique and desirable ride for many. While some of the results of the experimenting of 2007 were mixed, their next coaster would shape their entire trajectory for years to come. Working on their sixth coaster for Cedar Point, Maverick would debut as Intamin's first true blitz, or what is now known as a multi-launch coaster. After only building the biggest and best versions of their coasters for Cedar Point, it was decided to scale down and deliver a new generation dynamic and reliable coaster style. Using the shorter three-car trains of Speed Monster, the LSM lift of Atlantis Adventure, and the snappiness of many other accelerator coasters before, Maverick was the true amalgamation of many years of innovations at Intamin and proved to be a massive success. The coaster did have a delayed opening due to the heartline roll of the ride exerting too much force on the trains, but once the ride opened it was hard to notice anything was missing due to how incredible the rest of the ride was. Featuring a beyond vertical drop, a twisted horseshoe roll inversion, which consisted of two corkscrews and some of the snappiest turns and single dives attempted yet, Maverick completely changed the game, and now the goal for Parks was no longer to build the biggest rides ever, but the best rides ever. Intamin continued to innovate and build great versions of existing models in 2008, starting with Avatar Airbender at Nickelodeon Universe in the Mall of America. This indoor surf rider would be themed to the popular cartoon show and get very close to the skylights inside the mall. Intamin would also improve their straddle coaster style ride greatly with Jet Rescue at SeaWorld Australia. These trains would be greatly simplified with a jet ski style vehicle that retained a comfortable upright seating position with optional handlebars. This coaster would also feature two launches and a much more dynamic layout than the previous year's coaster. Hershey Park would once again contact Intamin to build a unique coaster that would be somewhere between a multi-inversion coaster and the Blitz style of Maverick the year before. The result was Fahrenheit, a coaster which featured the three-car train, beyond vertical drop, and quick airtime moments of Maverick, but with Intamin's first true vertical lift hill instead of a launch. This was the same double chain lift of the Zack Spins and dropped riders into a layout featuring six inversions, including the Norwegian loop from Speed Monster, a Cobra roll, and a double corkscrew. Arguably the best coaster of the year would come from the final prefabricated wooden coaster to be built, T-Express at Korea's Everland. With Son of Beast closing the next year, T-Express would soon become the tallest and third longest wooden coaster in the world and be the culmination of the three prefabs before it. Featuring the cable lift, steep drop and rapid turns of El Toro, the massive hills of Colossus, and then after hitting the mid-course, it would complete the exact same layout of Balder. All these elements led many to believe T-Express to be the greatest of all the prefabs built and a worthy finale to the model as one of the best Intamin has ever produced. While T-Express may have been a beast of a coaster, the other new model created for the year would be a worthy successor of things to come. 
Continuing the small stature design of Maverick, Intamin would develop a small-scale mini hypercoaster style layout known as a Megalite. This layout would have the cable lift, steep drop, and strong airtime of the mega coasters, but at a height of just 100 feet. Intamin hoped this model would be a cheaper alternative to parks looking for a smaller scale ride while not compromising on quality at all. And the first two to open would be Kawasemi at Tobu Zoo and Piraten at Jurz Summerland. The layout featured a drop directly into a low to the ground turn that threaded the lift followed by many steep airtime hills providing very strong airtime. Intamin would finish out the Ox with another wide range of different coasters, starting right where they left off with two more Megalites, with Flyover Mediterranean at Happy Valley Genou and Simply Megalite at Happy Valley Shanghai. The new Shanghai Park would also see the well-themed Mine Train Coaster open, strangely featuring the layout and trains of Olven at Bakken, neither of which had been used in over a decade. Speaking of Bakken, the oldest park in the world would once again work with Intamin for a truly bizarre and unique coaster. This would be the third Intamin to be named Tornado, but instead of an inverted coaster, this would be a one-of-a-kind spinning coaster. Featuring the Zaxpin style over-the-shoulder straps, the single-car trains would take four riders facing each other abruptly up a high-speed double-chain lift, almost acting as a launch through a ridiculously intense layout. The quick spinning on top of a violent rapid-fire layout may have created a more intense ride than Bakken and Intman were expecting, but it is still a coaster enthusiast favorite. The year would also see yet another hydraulic launch coaster in Senza Fiato at Miragica. This small scale coaster would feature a sort of updated layout of Rita and Desert Storm, featuring a half top hat instead of the low bank turn after the launch. The year would also see the return of the Zaxpin with Insane at Gronalund. This would feature a larger layout with several small drops rather than the one large of the previous installations. But the real highlight to put the true exclamation point on the decade would be the second ever Blitz coaster at Mirabilandia in Italy. This version would feature only one launch but would essentially be the culmination of almost every element Intamin had created over the last 10 years or so featuring the strong launch of Volcano, the top hat of Accelerator, the ejector airtime hill of Superman Ride of Steel, the low to the ground turns of Rita, the single dive like drops of Expedition G-Force, the high speed heartline roll of Maverick, and the slow inline twist of Cannonin, Ice Speed would be the perfect opus of what Intamin had achieved in these last 12 years, and would also be a preview into what was to come as well. Intamin would enter the next decade with a fantastic slate of new diverse attractions around the world, starting with another coaster for Disney. Themed to the Toy Story movies, RC Racer would open at Walt Disney Studios Park in Paris and would be a Surfrider variant with a unique 20 passenger train themed to the character from the films and theming to the structure to mimic Hot Wheels track. Next would be a return to Alton Towers for another unique secret weapon project. With Intamin always willing to push the boundaries and Alton Towers always having high ambition, a whole new technology was developed for 13. Featuring the family coaster trains, the ride would start out innocent enough up a booster wheel lift and a trip around the dark woods before hitting another small lift and entering a building. Once inside, Riders would come up to a wall, and with seemingly no way out, the whole train would bounce and then drop 16 feet. This would be the first drop track on any coaster, a new dimension of roller coaster design, which would catch riders off guard since it was hidden away in a building out of view. Riders would then be launched backwards and then stop at a transfer track before returning to the station. 
This special effects coaster would be very impressive for the time and inspire many rides in the future. After two smaller scale coasters, Intamin would reach new heights not attempted for years with their next two coasters. And with this high thrill demand coming, it was time for yet another track innovation. Intamin would upgrade from their three pipe track used since Volcano to a new simple round spine that would be able to transfer to a second spine in high stress moments, as well as the ability of having longer stretches of track without requiring as many supports. The first of these coasters to open would be located at King's Dominion, ironically one of the first parks to debut Intamin's original major innovation. This time it would be for Intamin's second Giga Coaster, but this would be even more of a speed demon than Millennium Force. Intimidator 305 would take its namesake from the greatest NASCAR racer of all time, and would truly live up to that name with the giant steep cable lift and drop, but even more notably, a first-of-its-kind, minimalistic, two-support structure to give an eye-catching, arch-like appearance. The layout would be very similar to the Megalites, just blown up three times, and trading the many airtime hills for low-to-the-ground turns with incredible whip and speed. The massive nine-car train would drop 300 feet directly into a drawn-out low-to-the-ground turn exerting a ridiculous amount of sustained positive G's for the common rider and causing nearly everyone to lose vision until the giant airtime hill that followed. While the ambitious layout would be seen as amazing for coaster fans, many modifications were needed due to the blackout inducing forces caused by the ride. While I-305 may have been fast, it wouldn't even come close to the next coaster as Intamin would beat two of their own records again with their own longest and the world's fastest coaster in Formula Rosa at Ferrari World. This coaster would reach the 150 miles per hour mark, and instead of an even taller top hat than King Dakar Ka to break the height record, this layout would fly over 6,800 feet of track to become the third longest coaster in the world launching riders outside of the indoor park into a layout full of airtime moments and crushing turns. This would also be the first accelerator coaster since Top Thrill Dragster to use a lap bar only restraint in a very unique bulky Formula One themed train. The speeds would be so great that it would require front row riders to wear protective glasses in case of debris causing loss of vision as the ride sustained its speed incredibly well through the less than 200 foot tall layout. But after reaching higher speeds than would ever be touched for any ride, Intamin decided to retire the accelerator coaster model. After installing 14 in just 9 years around the world, the problematic hydraulic launch would be over and it would now be the age of the LSM launch. Disney would be pleased with the results of RC in Paris and would start 2011 with another model, this time at the Toy Story Playland being added to Hong Kong Disneyland. Next would be the final Zaxpin coaster to be built, as the model finally found its way to the United States at a park Intamin had built many coasters in the past. To coincide with the release of the DC Comics movie the same year, Green Lantern First Flight would open at Six Flags Magic Mountain with the larger 32 meter layout of Insane. This would unfortunately be one of the most notoriously bad coasters ever due to modifications made by the park, only operating for six years and probably contributed greatly to the death of this ride model. The year would have a true highlight though as Intamin would open their next Blitz coaster, being the first ever triple launch coaster in the world. Cheetah Hunt would open at Busch Gardens Tampa with a more tame layout than the two multi-launches before it, instead focusing on a sprawling family-friendly layout over the park's Animal Serengeti. The coaster also featured a unique wind catcher tower that would provide a figure eight 360 degree view rather than a top hat, as well as one heartline roll and a quick series of turns through a cave over water.
2012 would start off with a bang with another surf rider at Atala Happy Land Park. At first glance, this doesn't look any different from the other surf riders before it, but this would be the only 40 meter version built, twice as tall as any other. This extra height and location on the beach make it surely the best of its kind. Next would be an entirely new model, this time Intamin's take on the popular water coaster. While this market had been nearly solely owned by mock rides the last decade, Intamin would, pun intended, make a splash with Divertical at Mirabilandia. This would be over 60 feet taller than any water coaster built before it and is still the tallest water coaster in the world at 164 feet. The coaster would reach this height up a massive elevator lift, followed by a drop into a few turns and the classic big splashdown at the end. The third coaster of the year would be a whole new experiment for Intamin and would complete a trilogy of coasters for Hershey Park. The park looked to build a hyper coaster, but had very limited space at the time over a tiny creek. Intamin would use many of the designs from Intimidator 305, including the two support arch lift and the new double spine track, but develop an entirely new train to make this a new coaster model. Featuring single row cars and four wide seats, these trains would seat two riders in the middle and then one rider slightly outside and lower on the train to the left and right. Not only that, this would be Intamin's first coaster to feature a new generation over the shoulder lap bar, which would secure riders and allow for even more freedom. The result was possibly the world's most unique hypercoaster in Skyrush. While nearly every other hypercoaster focuses on large hills with airtime, Skyrush's largest moment is no more than 100 feet and instead uses its layout to focus on low to the ground elements with crushing positive and lateral g-forces and thigh breaking negative g-forces. The coaster would fly out of the station with the world's fastest cable lift, getting riders to 200 feet in seconds, so fast in fact that it needed to be slowed down after its opening year. This was yet another coaster from Intamin, whose park and audience may see the ride as too intense, and thus began a long period where Intamin was no longer looked towards to build large thrill rides in the United States. After over a decade with great relationships with Six Flags, Cedar Fair, and Hershey Park, Skyrush, along with other non-roller coaster ride failures, nearly blacklisted Intamin out of the public eye of many Americans. But this would not be the end, as it was now the time for more international coasters and more new models to win back the trust of the many U.S. chains. This new international period would begin in Turkey with another new generation family coaster with Maca Raparist at Vialand. This would be another intense family coaster featuring two large hills, fast helixes, and turns. Two coasters would be built in China, starting with an updated 10 inversion model in Crazy Coaster at Loka Joy Holiday Theme Park. This would now feature a cable lift into a new diving drop rather than the pre-drop on the previous version, as well as updated track, profiling, and lap bar only restraints on the accelerator style chassis. The second would be a new take on the wing coaster trains of Furious Baco, as well as the half pipe layout of the surf riders. This ride, named U shaped roller coaster, would sadly only operate for one year at Victory Kingdom and has been standing but not operating ever since. This would seat riders back to back facing each other with the Skyrush over the shoulder lap bars launching up and down large 187 foot spikes and would be the only model of this coaster ever built. The last coaster of the year would be the second updated motorbike coaster with Juvelin at Jers Summerland. This would seat riders on small ATVs on the search for a jewel 
and would be far more intense than the previous two motorbike coasters attempted. This would launch to 52 miles per hour and feature many fast low to the ground turns as well as a large hill. Intamin would make a small return to the United States next year with a roller coaster that was more of a dark ride but had a few prominent coaster sections. Working on their first coaster for Universal, this would be the headline attraction in the highly anticipated expansion of their very popular Wizarding World section of Diagon Alley. Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts would open to massive crowds at Universal Studios Florida and would feature large minecar ride vehicles that were able to spin throughout, giving an extra dimension to not only the coaster, but the dark ride scenes as well. The ride would begin with a tilt track, followed by a drop and a few show scenes before a launch through a screen and some more spinning after. Not the only highly themed coaster to open, Darkmare would open at Cinecia the World as the second multi-dimension coaster, featuring a large lift and screen effects, followed by a drop track and a small launch. Cinecieta World would also install another second generation Tenon version with Altair CCW0204. The last coaster of the year would be the second in a row for Via Land with Nefeskesen. This coaster was an example of a ride that surely would have been an accelerator model just a few years before, but now LSMs had no problem launching a train to 68 miles per hour over a large top hat. The coaster would then charge over a massive airtime hill, a dive loop, a stangle dive, and a wonky inline twist to end the ride, and featured the new lap bar only trains from the updated 10 inversion coasters. Twenty fifteen would see another two coasters come to Turkey, this time at Korsan Adasi, starting with the last Olven style layout in Family Coaster. The second would be a clone of Ice Speed in Red Fire, this time just featuring the lap bar only trains of the updated Tenon versions and Nefeskesen. Next would be a second water coaster in Hydro Racer at Zishuang Bana Sunak Land. This version would be scaled back from divertical with a shorter flume section, overall height, and less turns at the end, but in a nicer tropical location. The final coaster of the year would be located fully indoors at China's Roman Yu Park, known as Euro Express. This strange coaster would feature a cable lift along the wall of the building and then drop into a near exact mirrored layout of Kanonen. This would also be the only Intamin Blitz style ride to feature a two car train, featured lap bars, and would travel through many well themed European landmarks. After a few slower years, 2016 Intamin would come back in full force with five massive coasters. The first of these would be Typhoon Coaster at Land of Legends theme park in Turkey. This would easily be the best themed of the water coasters, featuring a small indoor show section before the vertical lift, and then a similar layout to Hydro Racer into a beautiful blue pool at the end. The Wing Hyper Coaster would make its second and final appearance with Flying Aces at Ferrari World, featuring a taller and larger layout than Skyrush. The ride also featured Intamin's first non-inverting loop, which would twist riders upright at the apex of the loop and then twist back down, an even faster lift than Skyrush, and a heartline roll at the end. Two coasters opened in China, the first of which being Coaster Through the Clouds at Nanchang Sunak Land. This would be the first traditional style mega coaster in over 10 years since Thunder Dolphin and would take riders up a massive 242 foot lift and down a 256 foot drop with many fast turns and strong airtime hills. 
This would be the only mega coaster to use the accelerator style chassis with the new style lap bars and may feature Intamin's first attempt of an outer banked airtime hill towards the end. The second would be a new concept of a launch coaster known as Soaring with Dragon at Haifei Sunak Land. This coaster would feature a brand new train design with a much more open setup with no step in and an updated version of the Skyrush over the shoulder lap bar with a more condensed shape and metal bars to hold. Riders would also sit slightly elevated so their feet would not touch the ground giving that same freeing feeling of the wing hyper. The ride would begin by pulling out of the station onto a transfer track where the train would stop and then launch forwards but not making it up the element and rolling back. The train would then launch backwards up a massive vertical spike, Intamin's first on a non-shuttle coaster and then launch forwards 77 miles per hour up a massive non-inverting loop. The ride would then drop into a gigantic inverted top hat before rocketing over airtime hills and twists and turns around a large dragon statue. This layout with a spike and multi-pass launch would turn the heads of many parks and pushed Intamin to find a way to improve the layout to be even more thrilling. The final coaster of the year would put Intamin back into the public conversation of the world as the immaculately themed Phantasialand in Germany would contact Intamin to build one of the most eye-catching coasters ever. Taking place in the fantasy village of Klugheim, Terran would use the new generation trains of Soaring with Dragon to take riders through an unreal landscape of rockwork and buildings never seen on such a scale before. While the Blitz coaster would have no inversions, it would launch riders twice over endless crossovers in a layout that would be impossible to memorize. The coaster featured many small hills and turns that were beginning to become popular at the time and proved to the world that nobody could still build a thrill coaster as dynamic as Intamin. The next year would be another huge one with six new coasters opening, all being different models. The smallest would be the third Intamin at Ferrari World, Turbo Track. This would not be the massive coasters of Formula Rosa and Flying Aces, instead just a small shuttle coaster. Twelve riders would be seated on a single car train, with the middle riders facing each other, and launch over a small hill, up a twisted spike through the roof, and then back. While the ride as a whole may be somewhat underwhelming, it would be the first coaster to feature an LSM launch on non-straight track, which would prove to be very useful for not just Intamin, but other manufacturers in the future. Next would be the final Megalite to be built with Lightspeed at Visionland, which strangely has no footage online, as well as another 10 inversion coaster with Vela Kalukski Mayaso Combinat 2 at Wonder Island. There would also be another straddle coaster, this time back in the United States with Wavebreaker the Rescue Coaster at SeaWorld San Antonio. This would be themed to jet skis and have a new large lap bar and take riders above water and on an island with two tire launches. This year would also see the return of the inverted coaster as Intamin had not built one for nearly 15 years, but this time as a new model for families. Drow Kong would be the third Intamin at Jersh Summerland and feature a new seven row train with the same seat and lap bar developed for the new multi-launch coasters. This coaster would feature a small tire launch out of the station through a small indoor section and then up a lift where families would be plunged into a strong layout featuring many fast turns and small drops. The biggest coaster of the year would be the new tallest and fastest coaster in Europe at Spain's new Ferrari Land Park. Red Force would be a return to the large top hat style coaster for Intamin, but now as an LSM launch instead of hydraulic. Riders would be seated in a three car new generation train and roll out of the station into a 112 mile per hour launch over a 367 foot top hat 
and down a straight drop before a small hop into the brakes. This is still the fastest and tallest any Intamin LSM launch coaster has gone, and many wonder if it is the limit of the technology compared to the more unreliable hydraulics. Twenty eighteen would see even more coasters open than the year before, beginning with their last coaster for Disney, Rex's Racer. This would be a third RC layout and be an addition to the new Shanghai Disneyland. There would also be two more straddle coasters, both being themed to ATVs. Yukon Quad at Le Pal would be a clone of Juvelin, and Paradise Fall at Asia Park may have the most tame layout of any family launch built yet, with a launch into a wave stall and then a very slow layout around some turns. There would also be a second family inverted coaster with Fast and Furious at the indoor Warner Brothers Movie World Abu Dhabi. This would be themed to the Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner shorts from the Looney Tunes and take riders through quick show scenes in the famous rock canyons from the cartoons. There would also be another multi-launch coaster at Shanghai Haichang Ocean Park with Steel Dolphin. This would feature a small dip into a launch, followed by a top hat and some hills before Intamin's first true outward banked element. This would be a hill that would bank riders the opposite way of what would traditionally be the correct path popularized over the last few years by new manufacturer Rocky Mountain Construction. There would also be a second launch, many quick highly banked turns, strong airtime hills, and a dive into a shark's mouth. But a new park in Poland was about to flesh out its growing lineup even further with two large coasters named Energylandia. The first would be Speed, a water coaster and a near clone of Divertical and the second would be a new generation mega coaster named Hyperion. This would be an evolution of the wing hypers attempted before, with a similar seating arrangement, but a floor under the winged seats, as well as the modern lap bar from the new multi-launch coasters. This would also be the first mega coaster to abandon the cable lift, which had become the standard on all versions since Millennium Force for a chain lift that would take riders up the giant 252 foot lift. The cable lift would now only be used on the 10 inversion coasters and may be discontinued entirely at this point. Riders would plunge down the 269 foot drop, the tallest on any hyper coaster, over a massive hill and then through a dive loop turnaround. The coaster would then rocket through a low to the ground wave turn and then over more straight and twisted hills before a water splash at the end. Twenty nineteen would see another two Turkish Intamins be built, but these two would not see the great success of the other rides in the country. Anka Park, also known as Wonderland Eurasia would plan to open a staggering 17 coasters in 2019. While these would come from a wide variety of different manufacturers, the two Intamin coasters would be a 10 inversion known as Lightspeed and a jet rescue clone known as Chanavar Dalga. While Lightspeed did open to guests, it would not be for long as government issues caused the park to close just months after opening and all of its coasters to be standing but not operating since. Another project that faced many construction problems finally opened their new coaster as well, with Timmy's Halfpipe Havoc finally opening at Nickelodeon Universe in the long-delayed American Dream Mall. This would be a surf rider themed to the Fairly Odd Parents cartoon show, but be the first to feature a new lap bar only restraint for a more comfortable ride. The next coaster would be the very strange indoor coaster Kereta Misteri at Dunai Fantasi in Indonesia. The ride would feature a very slow indoor dark section themed to wolves before suddenly launching up a tire propelled lift into a show scene 
with a large terrifying wolf figure. The train would then take a backwards dip and wait for another switch track before dropping into another coaster section of drops and turns. After a few strange coasters, the last three of the year would all be world class, starting with the multi-launch Tega at Lennon Maki. The coaster would launch into an outward banked zero-g winder, some small snappy twists before hitting the second launch into a top hat and a first-of-its-kind element for Intamin, a large stalling dive loop. Intamin had dabbled into extended stalling inversions in the past, such as on Soaring with Dragon, but this was the first slow sustained inversion, as an attempt to mimic the sensations seen on many of the coasters from rival Rocky Mountain construction. The coaster would then travel a speed hill, followed by a large Immelman, more negative and positive G turns, before whipping through a quick barrel roll finale, similar to the inversion on high speed. This new generation of Intamin elements were definitely starting to show their inspiration from other manufacturers and industry trends, but their next coaster reminded everyone that nobody could still do it like they do. This would be the magnificent Dueling Dragons at Guangzhou Sunak Land, a massive multi-launch dueling coaster with one side being a standard sit-down train and the other being an inverted coaster with a similar configuration to the family inverted model. This had been attempted once before with Vekoma's Battlestar Galactica at Universal Studios Singapore, but was ultimately a failure due to the improperly weighted trains and different ride styles. Dueling Dragons would be a much more thrilling experience and would also be Intamin's first double coaster in over 20 years since all the way back to Lethal Weapon Pursuit. The experience would begin with both coasters pulling onto a switch track similar to Soaring with Dragon with the red sit-down train on top of the green inverted train before launching together halfway up a vertical loop. They would both then roll back and launch up a vertical spike before launching together to complete the loop. The green and red sides would then do their own unique layouts, featuring many quick inversions and airtime moments, while meeting up with each other multiple times for one-of-a-kind incredible flyby elements. But speaking of dueling dragons, in 2017, Universal's Islands of Adventure would close their incredible dueling Bolliger and Maviard coaster of the same name, and its replacement would come this year from Intamin. Made to fit better into the now Wizarding World land, the original concept of the replacement did not seem to please many of the thrill seekers who believed the B&M Invert was a more thrilling ride, but when Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure opened, the critics would quickly be silenced. First of all, the coaster would feature one-of-a-kind trains, with one seat of the car being a motorbike, similar to Juvelin or others opened before, and the other being a lower sitting, more standard sidecar. The trains would then travel into the forest and experience show scenes and animatronics through an unprecedented seven launches throughout the ride. The previous record was four, held by Maurer's Fiorano GT Challenge at Ferrari World, so that alone would be enough to impress, but Intamin was not done. Riders would be launched forwards up a vertical spike and travel through the world's first high-speed switch track. This device would perform a track switch while the ride was still in motion, so the coaster would not have to stop and wait for the track to transfer before going backwards. This would thrill riders who could not anticipate the switch coming, as riders were then launched backwards into another effect the trains would continue to back up into a show building into one of two drop track shafts, dropping 17 feet and pulling into another launch and some final turns before ending the ride. The number of special track elements, non-stop nature of the ride, multiple thematic elements, and ability to run a staggering 10 trains through the chaotic layout made Hagrid a worldwide phenomenon and completely changed the trajectory of Universal's attractions going forward. It would also be no surprise that all these elements 
ran up the price tag to a staggering $300 million, making it the most expensive coaster ever built. This would begin an incredible relationship between Universal and Intamin, as Universal had the money and ambition, and Intamin believed they had the technology and engineering to achieve the impossible. After a year of many incredible rides and due to other world events, Intamin would have a slower year in 2020. The COVID pandemic would make it difficult to open many rides to the crowds parks looked towards, so only four coasters opened. This would include Ipanema Skate Ride at Vin Wonders, another lap bar surf rider, and Objective Mars, a new style spinning coaster with indoor show scenes at Futuroscope. The coaster would begin with small fire and Tesla coil effects before going on a tilted track to view a screen. Riders would then travel outside to go through a tire launch into a free spinning coaster section before returning inside into a drop track. The coaster features large unique cars and has a similar large lap bar to the sidecar seats on Hagrid's. The next coaster would be the only coaster that was delayed from the opening of Nickelodeon Universe with Sandy's Blasting Bronco. Themed to the SpongeBob SquarePants character, this unique Intamin coaster would oddly use the older style lap bar trains found on Nefeskesen and launch riders through a compact layout with foreign versions. Once returning to the station, a turntable would spin the train backwards and would launch again, completing the same layout. The last coaster would be themed to another Nickelodeon show, this time being the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at Russia's Dream Island. This coaster would be Shred the Sewers, a ride with a dark indoor layout featuring a powerful launch into foreign versions and a small turn outside the ride's entrance. The ride would include a loop, dive loop, corkscrew, and a heartline roll finale with other airtime moments and thrills along the way. After a year of lockdowns and delays, the world was ready to see many of its postponed coasters open in 2021, beginning with the return of a model that hadn't been seen for nearly 20 years with the Impulse Coaster. This model, which was one of Intamin's first launch coasters, would upgrade to LSMs and feature their new inverted lap bar train found on Dueling Dragons with the same face on the front and back. The ride would launch riders back and forth with the same double twisting spikes of Wicked Twister, but stand slightly taller and go even faster and be known as Legendary Twin Dragon at Chongqing Sunak Land. The year would also see two new multi-dimension coasters open, starting with Namazu at Volcania. This would be the first special effects coaster to use the straddle coaster trains and would begin by pulling into a show scene with a drop track right at the start. The coaster would then hit a tire launch and travel through a field before reaching another launch and doing more fun turns before returning to the station. There would also be the studio tour at Movie Park Germany, which would take riders through a fantasy movie studio with some fantastic special effects from classic movie genres, including a twister scene where a roof gets ripped off a house, as well as a close encounter with King Kong. There would also be a turntable, as well as an awesome scene where your vehicle races a real car and then launches out of the show building. As far as special effects coasters go, this is definitely the highest quality a park has built with Intamin behind Hagrid's. Intamin would also build two coasters in China which were very similar to coasters they had built before. All speeds at Sunok Land Chengdu would be a near clone of Terran, and Light of Revenge at Happy Valley Chixia would be a very similar but reimagined version of Cheetah Hunt. While all speeds only had minor differences in some height and profiling changes to Terran, Light of Revenge would mirror and update much of Cheetah Hunt's layout 
as the original coaster was built for a very specific terrain. A speed hill was added at the bottom of the largest drop where it is just a straightaway on Cheetah Hunt and the mid course was eliminated for a low to the ground turn and a bunny hill. The coaster would also feature the new generation multi-launch trains and features many of the tunnels found through Cheetah Hunt's layout. There would also be another new model introduced with Big Dipper at Luna Park in Sydney. Rocky Mountain Construction had created a lot of competition in the coaster world in their short 10 years of existence and Intamin wanted a piece of their success with their single rail coaster design. While the original RMC Raptor coasters would feature a lift hill followed by a wickedly intense layout, Intamin's first attempt would use two tire launches to send the train through a compact layout at the seaside park. The train would essentially be their standard new multi-launch seats and restraints, just with one rider per row, and the ride would navigate two inversions and a few small airtime moments on the prototype layout. The last two coasters of the year would blow many away though, starting with Conda at Wallaby, Belgium. This would be yet another reinvention of the mega coaster, once again using the chain lift, but now the multi-launch trains, which are now just the standard Intamin thrill coaster trains. Riders would sit slightly lower profile with their feet being able to touch the ground and crest the lift into a twisting first drop which was certainly inspired by Expedition G-Force. Riders would then experience the standard giant first hill before passing over a large outward banked hill and then a large first of its kind non-inverting cobra roll. Instead of the corkscrews one would expect, the ride would outward bank to get on top of and dive below, creating two airtime moments. The ride would then complete a very RMC inspired finale with a large wave turn and many smaller bunny hills than Intamin would have built in the past to finish the ride. The true coaster to blow everyone away this year would be the second in two years to open at Islands of Adventure. Themed to one of the highest grossing movie franchises of all time with Jurassic World, the Lhasa Coaster would open as the first multi-launch coaster with a long six car train. This long vehicle would snake its way through a layout starting with two hang time filled inversions and some turns in a Velociraptor paddock before launching riders into a top hat over the park's lagoon. The coaster would then fly through Intamin's first true stall and then through a double helix which would include some wicked airtime moments before completing a high speed barrel roll over the water as the finale. The quick paced multi launching ride experience was something audiences in the United States hadn't seen like this in years, and the dinosaur theme made this a popular coaster to share and admire when it opened. As the 2020 pandemic slowed every park from purchasing new attractions, the three coasters of 2022 were the last of the delayed coasters to open. The first of which was Sick at Flamingoland, which would be another 10 inversion coaster in the United Kingdom. This coaster was actually built 10 years before in 2012 for a park in Brazil and was later sent to Malaysia before finally being sent to England. The next would be the unique Storm Coaster in the Dubai Hills Mall. This coaster would be located inside a large cylindrical tower and would feature a new vertical launch to send the trains to the top. The coaster would then use the supports from the sides of the building to work its way down, featuring small airtime moments and hang time filled inversions. The final coaster was a ride that was intended to open back in 2020 before the pandemic. As a result, Pantheon at Busch Gardens Williamsburg is not seen as much as the groundbreaking coaster it was when built. While Wavebreaker and Hagrid were certainly fun coasters, Pantheon was intended to be the first large intimate thrill coaster in the United States after a near decade of absence. This coaster would feature the high speed switch track of Hagrid and then travel through a layout full of elements found on Velocicoaster. The trains would leave the station and launch into a slow inversion, followed by some outward banked bunny hills and into a second launch. 
the launch would go over a speed hill, a technology that was first used on turbo track, and make it halfway up a top hat before falling back and launching up a straight vertical spike. This would be the fully fleshed out version of the switch track from Soaring with Dragon and Dueling Dragons, without needing the train to stop and wait to increase the thrill for riders. The train would then go over the top hat into a beyond vertical drop and into a large outward bank turn similar to Conda, and then through a massive stall with much more hang time than Velocicoaster. While Pantheon might not have as many elements or be as impressive as Conda or Velocicoaster, it was actually the original attempt at some of the elements found on those rides, even though it ironically opened after. Twenty twenty three is slated to possibly be Intamin's biggest year ever, with eleven coasters that have already or may open around the world. A trio of straddle coasters opened, including two in the United States, starting with Bush Gardens Williamsburg's second Intamin in a row, Dark Coaster. This coaster was built in the show building of a former dark ride in the park and features a unique layout where the coaster only has two launches, but due to a switch track, riders complete the layout twice, therefore getting four launches in total during the whole experience. The second is Arctic Rescue at SeaWorld San Diego, with vehicles also themed to snowmobiles like Dark Coaster, and looks like it could be the best of its kind yet. Being the first traditional tire launch straddle to feature three launches, the coaster looks to be another natural evolution of the model, with more unique banked turns and even more dynamic improvements to past installations. The third straddle of the year is Zakon at Fuji Q Highland, a ride that is certainly inspired by Hagrid's, with multiple LSM launches, an inclined spike, and a high speed switch track. The ride also features incredibly detailed and high quality trains with lights and onboard audio and a very tame but exciting layout. The year will also see the return of the Intamin Zack Spin of all things, coming to Silk Road Paradise. This will be the original 25 meter layout, just with a bit of an updated support structure and new restraints similar to some seen on recent Intamin flat rides. There will also be the second ever vertical lift multi-looper after Fahrenheit with Whale Breaking the Sky, or Barracuda, at Fully Ocean Happy World. This will feature a very similar layout to Fahrenheit, including a vertical loop, a dive loop, a cobra roll, a corkscrew, and a few airtime moments as well, and feature the old accelerator train chassis. That same park has also opened a spinning coaster named Twister, which is actually the second model of the intense spinning coaster from Bakken. This looks to be a much tamer version than the former, with fun underwater theming. It is also believed Algazal at Marial will be another of this model as well, as it is listed as just being a spinning coaster so far. This will be located adjacent to the massive 250 foot water slide complex opening in Qatar and can be seen in small glimpses of construction. Port Aventura will see its second Intamin in Uncharted El Enigma de Pentinence, which is another multi-dimension indoor coaster themed to the movie based on the popular video game series. This is an updated version of the ride system first used on Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts, with large trains that spin. The ride features multiple launches, a turntable, a spike, and great theming, and is another thrilling coaster anyone can enjoy. The true winners of the year are the three fantastic multi-launch thrill coasters, starting off with the first to open with Tutatis at Park Asterix, a coaster that had been in development for years. Back in 2018, Intamin revealed the layouts for Conda and Tutatis at Park Asterix, only revealing the parks that had bought them, with no name, theme, or opening time frame given. Tutatis was always going to open later, but its announcement video would be the first glimpse of how the fast track switch would work before Hagrid and Pantheon would be built. After even further delays from COVID, the ride is now open, 
and features a launch right into a slow inversion-like element, followed by two outward banked hills and then pulling into the high-speed switch track, just like Pantheon. The coaster then completes a similar multi-pass launch sequence before dropping down a trimmed top hat with an even steeper drop angle of 101 degrees, the steepest ever for Intamin, and completing a much more fully fledged out layout. The coaster has a similar stall, but many more low to the ground hills and outward banked elements, as well as an extra barrel roll at the end. The next would be going to another Warner Brothers park, this time being Park Warner Madrid. While Intamin had built six coasters in the past themed to Superman and even one to Green Lantern, this would actually be their first theme to the Caped Crusader with Batman Gotham City Escape. This will be the first major thrill multi-launch coaster to use onboard audio and will be a return to the three-car train which hadn't been used in many years, with commonly four or five cars being used. This results in a much snappier layout featuring some very quick transitions, as well as a couple hang time filled inversions, including a slow corkscrew, an extended reverse sidewinder, and a quick stall. This coaster also features a unique fake out spike into the brakes, similar to the spike on Hagrid's to end the ride. The quick modern layout of the ride, plus the threat of Batman's villains, will make this one of the most thrilling multi-launch coasters since Terran. The final coaster of the year will be another coaster at a SeaWorld park, but this time at the brand new SeaWorld Abu Dhabi. The chain had already built a B&M flying coaster and a mock multi-launch called Manta, and it was now Intamin's turn to build a coaster of the same name. This coaster begins by passing through a real aquarium before launching out of the indoor park into a super low to the ground layout with three total launches and many quick turns and small RMC-like airtime moments. The coaster has so many small elements packed in and features another four inversions similar to Gotham City Escape, with a hang time filled stall and dive loop, but also a fast corkscrew and barrel roll. The coaster also features some nice theming as it all takes place over sand to mimic the look of the bottom of the sea and passes through a shipwreck rock work, and waves towards the end. If all these coasters end up opening this year, 2023 could very well be the best for Intamin yet. There's been many great years as you have seen, but with 11 coasters and such a great balanced collection, the future has never looked brighter. Looking into the future, we currently know of at least eight new coasters coming in 2024 and beyond. First, there will be three coasters coming to another Nickelodeon universe, this time in China, and all themed to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mikey's Halfpipe will be another surf rider, and Shredder will be another spinning coaster. It's funny how Intamin didn't build any tornado-style spinning coasters for nearly 15 years while other companies thrived with the model, only for three to just show up over a two-year span. The third at the park will be another groundbreaking multi-launch coaster with Turbo Turtle Power, which will break the inversion record for a multi-launch coaster with eight, along with other impressive height, speed, and length stats. All these coasters being located indoors will certainly add to their thrill level as well. 2024 will also see a new family coaster coming to Drayton Manor. This ride will feature yet another new train style and looks to have good theming around a temple. A third Wallaby Park will join in on the Intamin fun when France's Wallaby Ron Alps will open a new Hot Racer single rail coaster. This coaster will feature another two launches and hopes to further develop the new model. Universal will continue their relationship with Intamin with a new How to Train Your Dragon themed coaster at their new Epic Universe Park in Orlando. This will be a smaller family coaster that will tour the land with two launches and will probably feature trains similar to the multi-dimension or family coasters. Universal will also add another coaster 
this time at their Hollywood Park. This is rumored to be a multi-launch coaster and will be themed to Fast and the Furious. This park is divided into an upper and lower level by a large hill connected by a long escalator and the coaster will seemingly travel this cliffside and around the escalator. This dynamic location and rumored four launches could easily make this the best coaster on the west coast of the United States when it opens. But on the horizon is truly a project that can only be described as unrealistic but is actually happening and will be the opus of Intamin, roller coasters, and the amusement industry as a whole. When Intamin broke the height and speed record with Top Thrill Dragster in 2003, they still couldn't claim the longest over Morgan's Steel Dragon 2000. While Steel Dragon still holds the record for the longest coaster, Intamin would break the height and speed record again with King Ka in 2005 and Formula Rosa in 2010 respectively. The closest anyone came to breaking these records in the past decade was with the Orlando Polar Coaster attempting to break the height record with a 500 plus foot tower and a vertical launch, but the plans fell through. Now, a brand new Six Flags Park opening in Qadiyah, Saudi Arabia will reach an ambition not attempted since the peak of the coaster wars, but even greater with a coaster named Falcon's Flight. This ridiculous ride will attempt to get the triple crown title of the tallest, fastest, and longest coaster in the world. The last coaster to ever claim this title, wood or steel, was 45 years ago with the Beast at Kings Island. Any of these titles are impressive to claim on their own, but reaching all in one ride will put this coaster in its own category that could not be touched in the foreseeable future. First, it will just break the speed record of its neighboring coaster Formula Rosa by 5 miles per hour to reach a ridiculous 155 miles per hour. This is probably the hardest record to break as humans probably can't take much more force than what traveling at that speed exerts and will be gained off the drop of the next record. This coaster will gain all its height by taking an extremely extended LSM lift to hop on top of a massive cliff and will take a near vertical 600 foot drop off. At the bottom of this drop will be an LSM boost to take the coaster over another unbelievable element, a gargantuan 530 foot arch. This element alone is over 70 feet taller than King Ka and is only the second tallest element on the ride. The ride will then burn off all this speed with an over 13,000 foot track length, which is over twice as long as Intamin's current longest Formula Rosa and over 5,000 feet longer than the current longest in Steel Dragon 2000. This is not to mention the layout begins with a fully fledged hyper coaster layout which alone would be an impressive ride. While many have doubted this ride since its inception, the coaster is well underway with track already installed, and if it can be pulled off, Intamin will lay claim to the true greatest ride ever built. Overall, we should be very grateful to have a company like Intamin, a manufacturer that never seems complacent and is constantly willing to upgrade their models and push the whole industry in places others won't. It always feels like they still have more to prove, and no matter how small the addition is, it is always exciting and noteworthy to have an Intamin coaster in your park. While it seems some chains have written them off or sworn against them, their incredible reputation and innovative mindset will always prevail and remain through their design language. The best part is, this series has only scratched the surface, as Intamin has also produced an equally, if not larger, catalog of water, 
flat, and observation rides that are just as impressive and industry pushing. Along with that, they also seem to be attempting many new concepts of screen-based and multi-dimensional rides as well that are sure to be just as impressive. I hope this series has entertained and educated you and stay tuned for more historical and conceptual videos in the future.